God is this perfect presence who is the one, as it were, that gives us the ultimate mooring of our existence, ultimate meaning that we yearn for. We want ultimate cosmic significance. We want to know where we fit into the cosmic totality. Welcome to the Purposeful Lab, a podcast brought to you by the Maja Center. I'm Catherine Hadro with Dr. Dan Keebler, and this is our final episode of season one. Yeah, we've come to the end of the, the first season, so congratulations. Congra- <laughs> I know, I feel like a handshake here. We did it, we, did we, it. we got uh, through it, and right. um, it's really culminated to this episode, to episode six, about human purpose. Right. Yeah. So we've looked at, you know, the the underlying order and structure of the cosmos all the way up to how that affects um, evolution and affects who humans are as a physical, biological being. But it goes beyond that. There's there's something more to us than just our biology, even though our biology drives us in one direction. There's there's more to it. And that's sort of the purpose and meaning of, 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 of who we are. Yes. And this episode, the last episode, we'll be speaking with Father Robert Spitzer, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. He's the president of the Magis Center and of the Spitzer Center. And we're speaking to him about purpose, but through the lens of the four levels of happiness, which he frequently speaks to this topic. And happiness is something that appeals to everyone. We're all really grappling with. For this. Yeah, I don't know many people. Um, I know all my kids want happiness yeah. and uh, all my students want happiness. You know, so it's something that's, that's universal. And uh, I think what makes people different is the, how we go about trying to get that happiness. And most yeah. of us go about it in the wrong way, I think. Yeah. And really, this idea that we're going to speak about is how happiness, this search for happiness, which maybe it sounds superficial to some, but really, happiness is intrinsically linked to purpose to human purpose, which we're all hardwired for. Yeah, we're hardwired to find that, I think, uh, in in a certain way. And I think when we try to find it in a different way, it leads to problems. And so I think that's what, you know, Father Spitzer is going to speak to um, in in our our interview with him. I think it'll be helpful just to kind of give an overview again about what we're going to talk about when we're going to have him walk through the four levels of happiness and then ultimately the four levels of purpose. So just to give an overview as to what those four levels are, level one is immediate gratification. So this is really fleeting surface level happiness, maybe the the happiness you get from your iced coffee, which I'm addicted to. It can um, be a good happiness. So yeah. I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> yeah, it can be a good happiness, but it's not the ultimate right, right. happiness. And then there's level two, which is this comparative happiness. Um, really the satisfaction we get in comparing ourselves to others. It's the Facebook happiness, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> the thumbs up or the thumbs yeah, down yeah, there. Right. But really what um, is going to be really important is this level three, which is contributive happiness. And it's making a positive difference for others. And would you right. say we're hardwired for that? As well, yeah, exactly. And he'll talk about that. The, yeah. the psychology studies that, that that look at that, how we are hardwired to go beyond ourselves. Yes, right? yeah. yes. And then ultimately, level four is the ultimate good, the enduring joy of living in goodness and in love. Um, and there are different ways to evaluate those levels of happiness. Three characteristics, if you will: it's pervasiveness, it's enduring ability, and it's depth. Too. Right. Yeah. So some of them you know, are fleeting. Some yeah. of them um, are, are very, very deep. They, they they fill your whole being with happiness rather yes. than just your stomach, for yes. example. <laughs> and, and overflow to others yeah. as well. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, you know, with that, let's get to it. Let's go speak with Father Spitzer about human purpose. Excellent. Father Spitzer, welcome to the Purposeful Lab. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, obviously very wonderful and a great opportunity to be with both of you. We're so grateful for this. And and this is obviously a Maja Center podcast. You're president of the Maja Center, a familiar voice and face to many. We're going to speak to you this episode about human purpose as understood by the four levels of happiness and to really place that into context for us. But before we dive in, I'd love to just spend a moment to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, you're a philosopher, an educator, author, speaker, former president of Gonzaga University and a Catholic priest, which I think is obvious to many of our viewers. You are also an expert in philosophy of science and in metaphysics, among other topics. 
Have you always been interested in science? When did that really come about for you? Well, my father was a uh, an electronics uh, whiz, and uh, so he was always doing something in the house. I mean, we were we grew up on night kits, but nobody knows what those are anymore. But they, they're like put it together radios and put it together, uh, you know, little uh, uh, transmitters and so forth and so on. And and my dad was a big ham radio operator, so we, we I was looking around the house all the time, and there'd be trap verticals and uh, you know, huge transmitters, things all over the house. And my, my dad would, of course, explain all these things to me. And I had to bur burrow underneath them. You know, I had to find out, well, exactly what is an electron? <laughs> what do you mean it can have two forms, waves or particles? I don't get it. And, of course, dad would give me the Britannica article, which had so many equations that I couldn't possibly understand it in the fifth grade. So I uh, went to the World Book Encyclopedia and then uh, tried to, ferret my way back to the Britannica with, oh, and it begins right in my childhood with my great father who really had a love for science and a love for uh, uh, electrodynamics and electronics and things like that. So um, that's where it all started. That's amazing. You were a curious kid. <laughs> a very curious kid. Oh, I had to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Father. Um, you know, know what it is. <laughs> Well, it's great, Father. You're the perfect person here, I think, to uh, end our first season here. So this is uh, um, episode six of our first season of the, the Purposeful Lab. And what we've done in this first season is started off of looking at the underlying purpose and um, or underlying order in the universe from the level of the physics to the chemistry to the biology to the human person and then to what that um, sort of points towards uh, in terms of the, the purpose of, 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 of humanity, of, 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 of each one of our lives, right? And so you, you sort of span these. You're coming here at the end to talk about human flourishing and, you know, the levels of, of four levels of you know, purpose for humans. Culminating yeah. to that ultimately in this, in this final episode and to that point, happiness, I mean, this is a topic that appeals to everyone. Everyone in some form of another is, is seeking out happiness. Aristotle has said that happiness is one thing we desire in and of itself. Everything else is desired for the sake of happiness. And now, Father, you have studied Aristotle and the other great philosophers and theologians. And in doing so, you refined a model of the four levels of happiness. So again, today's episode, we're going to discuss human purpose, but as understood by these levels of happiness, can you give us an overview of what these four levels are? Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. So happiness basically is the satisfaction of a desire. Unhappiness is the non-satisfaction of desire, either leaving us wanting um, or unfulfilled, or sometimes if we're lacking food and things of that nature, in danger of our lives. Mm -hmm. So happiness, though, is the satisfaction of that desire. And, um, and uh, it, it oftentimes is reduced to a feeling, but it's, it's more than a feeling. It's really a state of being. That's the way Aristotle looked at it. Happiness was a fulfillment of our being. Yes, it produces a feeling of elation. Uh, yes, it could produce a feeling of well-being, but it's much more than a feeling. It is the actual fulfillment of our being, and it's that fulfillment of our being uh, that is, uh, um, um, you know, the, the well-being of it gives rise to the feeling of well-being. Let me put it that mm -hmm. way. So ontology, being, precedes feeling here. Um, and unfortunately, our culture thinks that feeling proceeds being in fact they don't even think about well-being as being they think about well-being as feeling and you know uh, it never occurred to them that it could really be the state of who i am and what i am and that's how aristotle thought of it mm -hmm. so if you look at it that way then uh, aristotle said well you can have some uh, kinds of happiness uh, which fulfill very basic um, desires but unfortunately, they are not going to do very much good beyond the self. They're not going to be very enduring, and they're not going to be very deep. And what he meant by that is, um, you know, pervasive just means, you know, uh, some form of happiness. So if I'm happy, 
this happiness is going to seep out um, to a whole bunch of other people, maybe seep out to my family, or maybe it's just going to affect me and that's it. So he said, I'll say that a, a more pervasive happiness is a better kind of happiness because it's going to affect more people. And then he comes back and he says, uh, I think a more enduring happiness is a better kind of happiness. So if a happiness level, well, maybe it lasts for a half an hour, well, that's not that great. But if happiness could last for years or indeed a lifetime or indeed an eternity, why, that would be much better happiness than shorter versions of happiness. So he said, yeah, the enduring thing. But there's a, what he calls deep. And what he meant by the, you know, a, a deep form of happiness is one that fulfills all of the characteristics, all of the needs or desires of a human being. So not just your desire uh, for food and shelter, those are basic and important, no doubt, but we have much higher desires than that, right? So higher, just think of higher like deep. Mm -hmm. So the, um, we have higher desires like love, uh, where we want to empathize with others, to do good for others, to make a difference to others, etc. Where There's also intellectual desires. Aristotle viewed those very highly, where we could actually make a contribution uh, through our thought, through our creativity, uh, make them, you know, not just better technologies, but, you know, have a reflection on life that would better the quality of life um, if we studied it, if we knew about it. Um, and so he thought all of these desires, uh, intellectual, of course, the desire for the good was really important uh, to Aristotle, certainly to all the classical philosophers and medieval ones as well. Plato surely thought the same thing. Uh, so the desire for justice uh, that goes beyond the self, uh, the desire to, for virtue, um, those good uh, classical virtues that we call the cardinal virtues, um, you know, fortitude, the stick to itness, the, the perseverance, um, you know, to, to keep going there and the courage to keep going. Also temperance, right, to resist um, passions when those passions can become destructive. The virtue also um, uh, to um, uh, pursue justice as an end. Uh, that would be, you know, the, the classical highest virtue. And then prudence, of course, being the wisdom to know what to do to get the highest form of justice, to get the most significant kind of life. And that's, at the end of the day, what Aristotle mm. wanted. Significant, meaningful life that touched other people on, on highest levels as well as basic levels, but <clears throat> to touch them on those uh, levels and to have it be as enduring as it could be. And he said, now those are the higher forms of happiness. So you could just see that's how he went ahead and classified. So happiness level one is basically like a bowl of linguine, hmm. right? I lunge toward the bowl of linguine, wolf it down and go, yum. Yes, I am happy, but it's not pervasive. It's not enduring. And it's certainly not fulfilling my higher levels of, of, of being and the higher levels of being of other people. Uh, it's just basically a great bowl of linguine. It's intense. It's immediately gratifying and it's surface apparent. But beyond those three things which rivet me to itself, because I like linguine, right? The idea is it's not going to do much good. It's a low form of happiness for mm. Level two is just a little bit higher. He calls that ego comparative happiness. So this comes, you know, it's an ego high. And it basically comes from winning. Uh, you know, we're always, you know, in some sort of um, contest of comparative advantage, right? So, um, you know, we're looking at who's achieving more and who's achieving less, who's got more power, less power, more intelligence, less intelligence, more accomplishment. Less accomplishment, uh, more athleticism, less athleticism, more beauty, less beauty. Um, you, you know, you name it, we can compete on it. And so long as it can be compared to other uh, human beings um, and we can be found um, either winning or wanting, right, um, uh, then uh, we're in the game. All we want to do is win and not be part of the poor old loser. 
So um, that's uh, a second is there. Uh, I would say that my own sort of you know private research indicates that this country pretty much is about 70 percent uh, dominant level two happiness. That's hmm. the most important kind of happiness in this culture for about 70 percent. Even kids who are 16 years old yeah. uh, is happy. It culture. seems like that level is one of those levels that you're just not going to be satisfied because it, you, you, you're there's always going to be losers at that level, right? So yeah. if that's what you're banking also, on. We're all gonna we're gonna we're gonna have a yeah. lot of disappointed people, right? And oh yeah, but of course, if you, God help you, as we say, if you reach a plateau. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like that's what our social media culture is just built on. Like it is literally built on us comparing ourselves to others in one way or another, too. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly prior to COVID, Instagram was uh, and, and Facebook, etc., which is doing its damage beyond belief. I mean, I think the level of, you know, an early level of level two acquisition as dominant probably came about maybe a good 15 years, along with Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, that's where it really started going crazy. People taking selfies, people, you know, you know, come, you know, here I am with this person. Here I am in this very nice setting. Don't you wish you were me? A gigantic cry for attention, which does nothing for anyone except give a temporary fulfillment of ego desire, which is really destructive because in the long term, uh, as I'll explain later, <clears throat> it's going to lead to um, depression, mm. high levels of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, antisocial aggressivity, substance abuse, um, and a variety of familial tensions for sure. Yeah, it reiterates your point that comparative happiness, this is not enduring, fulfilling happiness. It's so evident. And so what is that third stage? What is that third level? Excellent question. Yeah, that would be contributive happiness. If you look at level two happiness as shifting the locus of control over to you, right? Here I am the winner. Here I am the most intelligent. Here I am the most achieved, etc. That's shifting the focus, locus of control to myself. But now if, in level three, what you're really doing is shifting the locus of control to others. Mm -hmm. You're basically saying, Look, I'm going to make an investment in the world. What's going to make my life worth living, what's really going to make me happy is if other people are thriving because of what I try to do in my life. I'm going to try and make my family better off. And when I find that my family is, or at least maybe they're not, but I tried, it does bring me this sense of happiness, but it feels very different from an ego high. Right, there's a kind of a feeling of of, um, of elation that, instead of being an ego high, it's kind of a contributive spirit high, is what I call it. Uh, my life has significance because you know, because you know, it's uh, you know, because of what I have done, it's made a difference to them, uh, to their well-being, to their happiness, and especially if I can make the higher kinds of differences to their spiritual life to their um, moral life, uh, to their um, uh, religious practice, to the intellectual and creative life as an educator, mm. right? If I can do all of these kinds of things, um, even to their capacity for empathy and generosity in the imitation of Christ, right? If we can do these kinds of goods for other people, you can just see, you can feel basically your sense of self-worth that's based not on empty comparisons, which mean nothing after we're dead, but boy, on contributions, which really do mean a lot and can last well into the future and all the generations of people that you have uh, influenced. You say, well, that's kind of a, you know, a sort of a utilitarian way of looking at things that you kind of define your existence. And, how much good do you have and how many things you crossed off your list. It could be utilitarian if that's the reason you did it. But if you did it because of your love of those people, 
if you did it because not you wanted a great list, but you wanted those people to be better off. If you did it because you wanted, it, you thought that this is what God would want, that it would fl- make his kingdom flourish, and that, um, you know, doing this for him would be, you know, the best thing you could ever do to enhance his kingdom in this lifetime, why that would make you happy. Mm. But it's not happy in any kind of a utilitarian way. It's, ha- it's, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm doing more good than you are. That's not the point. I'm doing good, and the good makes a difference Mm -hmm. to others, to God, and is likely to do Mm -hmm. so long after I live. Father, um, when you speak about this level three, this contribute happiness, you often cite Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. Can you tell us his story and how he illustrates this level three happiness? Yeah. Well, to make a, a very long story short, so everybody ought to read Man's Search for Me. That's my first thing. Is don't let this book uh, pass you by uh, during your lifetime. It's a classic. It's excellent. Basically, uh, Viktor Frankl's in a prisoner of war camp, and um, you know, in Auschwitz. And uh, while he is there, he begins to glean some lessons. He's he's a psychiatrist, and he was previously a psychiatrist with some Freudian leanings. Uh, but he changes his mind um, as he's, um, you know, s- sort of surviving in this camp because he notices that really there are two kinds of prisoners, those that are investing themselves in others, those that are thinking about, man, when I get out of here in the future, uh, I'm going to tell people all about this so that this never happens again. Or if I have a crust of bread that I think I can spare without dying, I'm going to give that to this man, even though I crave it with all my heart right now, right? Um, I'm I'm going to do this. I'm going to help people get along. What he found in the camp was people like that, and we'll talk about the spiritual proclivity in just a moment, but that's another one, too, that's very Mm -hmm. important. He said, we become much more than the, uh, what you might call the mechanistic view of human beings that his predecessor, Sigmund Freud, had, right? So uh, Freud was very much, uh, you know, about repressed libidinal instincts, you know, mechanistic view of the human person, et cetera. And um, uh, Frankel, looking in the camps, you know, he begins to say, it's not anything like this at all. And then he begins to discover who lived and who died. The people who just focused on themselves and just said, I'm going to hold on until the Allies liberate us at Christmas. Then the Allies didn't liberate them at Christmas. And they would literally die. They would die because their whole purpose, right, was to simply get liberated and get out of this torment. They died. Many of them died. Not all, but many of them died. And many of them were really, you know, transformed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, transfixed by um, the, the depression, the malaise that they felt in the camp until the point where they just kind of lost hope. Alternatively, the people who really focused on other people or focused on their family and what they're going to do for their family when they get out or focused on what they're going to say to the world about this horrible condition and how it happened and so forth so that it'll never happen again. All those people why they kept living. And even though it was just as cruel for them, at the end of the the day, they survived the camp. And so um, basically, Frankel said, you see, it's not just, um, you know, getting rid of, you know, repressed libidinal instincts, right? The real thing is meaning, purpose, having some objective, an objective beyond myself. The whole idea of using the term contributive is it is beyond ourselves. And so if I'm living for my family, living for my friends, living to um, uh, make a difference to my church or to the kingdom of God or to my workplace or organization or the students in the workplace or the organs or to the, you know, my, um, uh, a community, you know, uh, being 
a coach of a little league team and just giving some kids a great sense of their talent and lovability and goodness, uh, whatever it may be, the more we do that, the more our purpose is filled with this sort of very difficult to identify spirit. But it's a spirit, said uh, Frankel, that makes you live longer, that makes you more productive as you're living longer, that makes you more sensitive in your interaction with others as you're living longer. This spirit, you might say, well, it's really intangible. I can't put my finger on it. True enough, intangible as you look straight on, but you can see it, as Aristotle would say, through its effects. You can see how it lengthens life, how it lengthens purpose in life, how it you know, enhances empathy in life, and how it you know, it, you know, leads to a greater sensitivity to morals and principles in life. I'm not just living for myself anymore. Mm. I want to make the greatest impact to the greatest number I can make because uh, you know that's the only thing that's worthy of me. I don't want to get to 80 years old and go, <laughs> what was the difference between the value of my life and that of a rock? And have to say, well, the rock probably did more for family, friends, church, kingdom of God, and community. I was a really good narcissistic rat that basically called a whole lot of attention to myself. Am I not proud of that? It doesn't work. It backfires, mm. as Frankel would say, into death. Wow. That's so profound. And it seems like that level three, that contribute happiness, really counters against despair, especially and including in um, the end of our life. And it seems like that is just so incredibly fulfilling. And yet there is still a deeper level when it comes to levels of happiness, level four. Um, can you summarize what level four is? Right. So level four happiness, uh, all of us have inside of us. And this is Victor Frankl wrote another book called Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning. And he wrote another book called The Unconscious God, um, I think way back in 45, which after the war, and then he had it revised in about 76 or something. But anyway, in these two books, what he describes is another dimension to human being. Let's just call it <clears throat> the spiritual dimension. That's what he calls it, for lack of a better term. He's in a constant interaction with Freud and Jung um, in this regard. And, and Jung, um, you know, has the view. Um, he, Jung gave a corrective to Freud right away. He said, no, human beings are not just mechanistic. They're never going to be explained by your, um, you know, purely materialistic viewpoint, uh, Freud. Human beings have religious desires. And those religious desires um, form what... Um, uh, Jung called the archetypes, a collection of archetypes which um, were held kind of in, in what uh, might be called this universal uh, collective memory uh, called the collective, un he calls it the collective unconscious. Now, th that was Jung's point of view, but um, uh, Frankl wanted to go deeper in that interaction. He said, you know, it's not just the archetypes where our feelings where our states of being uh, dwell. Um, yes, it could be in the archetypes, um, which are held in what he calls the psyche. But there's also something called spirit with a small s in every human being. And that small s spirit is looking not just for something ultimate um, in a depersonalized way, so Aristotle talked about the ultimate in a very depersonalized way, right? The perfect goodness, perfect truth, perfect love, perfect beauty, and perfect being or home. That was Aristotle's, you know, kind of depersonalized. But um, Victor Frankl says, no, no, no. It's more than that. There's really some kind of a personalized ultimate that we are aware of. It's almost part of our being. It's received by this spiritual dimension uh, within us. And so he's saying to Jung, the archetypes are fine in the psyche. Um, there is some truth to that. That probably explains why there's so much similarity between the dreams of young children, uh, particularly the cosmic significance 
of young children's dreams. However, it's more than that. It's more than a personalized story. It's a personalized being. And the personalized being uh, is a transcendent being. But we have some sort of interior awareness of this. And, you know, as Augustine so perfectly put it at the beginning of the Confessions, for thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And Frankel would be more on that level, that God has made himself present in us. He's not just a horizon of the transcendentals of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being in our lives. God is this perfect presence who is the perfect ultimate, who is the one, as it were, that um, gives us the ultimate mooring of our existence, ultimate meaning that we yearn for. We want ultimate cosmic significance. We want to know where we fit into the cosmic totality. It's interesting how you point out the the, the, the infinite that, that's in us, that transcendent mm -hmm. experience. That's something we've talked about. Like When you look at the cosmos, like staring up at the cosmos, right? when, mm -hmm. when you look out at the stars, you see this vast uh, infinity there, and you have uh, often people staring at the uh, at the immense beauty there uh, have this transcendental experience that r roots them in uh, this sort of fourth level of happiness. Know that they're part of something that's larger, but it's infinite. It's not just another person um, like uh, you know Catherine here. Or it's something that goes mm -hmm. beyond that. Um, it, it's it's real uh, interesting that uh, that. that it ties in with our, our view of, of, of nature and the natural world that we see. Oh, yeah. I mean, unlimited, unlimited time going forward, unlimited in power, unlimited in act, unlimited in intelligence. It's that insight, which we in our human minds can only grasp through the via negativa, right? Not finite, not limited, not temporal. Um, you know, not material, not, 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 not. It's the only way we can get it. Um, but God, of course, grasps it uh, in himself. Uh, there's a brilliant book by a guy named Bernard Lonergan um, that points it out very clearly, a book called Insight. And in chapter 19, um, you can see that really what we have in us is um, the notion of being. And we have this sense of the unlimited, um, a universal blank in our understanding that requires being filled in. But, you know, if we didn't have that universal blank that we knew needed to be filled in um, within this, as it were, unlimited structure, this unlimited domain of being, if we didn't know that, we'd never ask a question, says Roger. Without the notion of being, the apple would drop on our heads and we'd just look at it and eat it. <laughs> I mean, that's all there is to it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. the point, of course, is uh, our reflection process and our constant asking of questions, but not just in the intellectual level. It's also on the level of love. I'm not going to be content with just some love. I want to be loved perfectly, and I want to love perfectly. Mm -hmm. I want my ego out of the picture. And frankly, I'd like to be loved by someone with their ego out of the picture. Now, the more we get there, the better off. But we know when it's not perfect. We know every single time. And how could we know? But the whole point is, is God's present to us. That personal being is present to us. He's not just making intelligence possible or love possible on the unrestricted. Uh, the unrest we, he, Lonergan calls it the unrestricted desire to know, the unrestricted desire for love, the unrestricted desire uh, for goodness or morality. Uh, justice, etc. All these things are basically the so-called unrestricted desire. But those things, um, when you really look at it, it's all imbued with the personal love of God. And when we ignore that, I mean, God's with us from the day of our conception. Make no mistake about it. Even the brand new infant soul is aware of God, even though we can't attribute, right, the physical brain is not there. We don't have the capacity of verbal production to say it. Oh, from the moment of our conception in our mother's wombs, there's already a sublime 
uh, you know, a sense of God's presence. And when we ignore this, I mean, little children, you don't have to tell little children the truth of religion. Little children know the truth of religion. And it's not just because they're aware of Jungian archetypes in their dreams. They actually are aware of some kind of mysterious creator, transcendent, spiritual, and a fascinating, energizing, urgent kinds of presence that is within them. And they, if you tell them, well, what you're sensing is the sacred, they might get that a little bit, the holy and the sacred, but they're not quite there yet. But if you say, well, that's God, you know, that is this uh, transcendent being that mommy and daddy love. And so you say that to a little kid, <laughs> that I get kid, it. It, it, it hits it. Yeah. You hit it right on, the kid gets it. You don't have to say anything more. You know, they, they might ask you a ton of questions about God, as I'm sure I did. <laughs> I know I drove my mother crazy <clears throat> with many, many questions. But I was fascinated, that's the only word for it, by God. Fascinated then when I started going to church, I would just look at those stained glass windows and there was something, the mystery intrinsic to the window. And you say, well, it's just a bunch of colors going through it, a bunch of wavelengths. And yeah, I suppose some of them are more aesthetically appealing than others. It's more than that. The figures, the colors, the arches, the everything else in the window are all conveying the mystery that I know exists within myself and is almost quaking within me as I gaze upon it. It's almost switching on God's presence, God's mystery, God's fascinating uh, super presence uh, in me. You know, my creature consciousness is awakened at a full level. And when that happens, then all of a sudden, I I am, as Mercia Eliade said, why are 90% of the people in the world religious? Because God's present to 100% of us from the point of our conception. That's why homo religiosus, that's what we should be called. But he is present. And yeah. all you need to do the least amount of work, little kids get it. Hmm. And they know that God somehow is good. You it's have intuitive. to teach. Yeah, it's intuitive. You don't have, you know, you have to teach kids that God would be an ogre or something in order for them ever to get that impression. Their natural intuitive sense is that he's good. Their natural intuitive sense, they won't use the word holy or something, but they will sense the mystery. They sense the spiritual presence and the love embedded in that, the personal love, as Frankel would say, embedded in the interior presence. They won't articulate it like me, obviously, but surely they know it, they feel it, uh, both not only on the conscious level, but on the subconscious yeah. level. Yeah, and you've got these the, those four levels of, of happiness you see there. Um, it, it's interesting how you know, that, that we're oriented towards all four of them mm -hmm. and just to move your way up. And then if we if we if we stop somewhere in the middle, we're frustrated. Right. And it sort of entails that there's a purpose. Like none of them are bad. Right. The first level of happiness and being happy with your fettuccine is, is not a bad yeah. thing. Right. Um, um, and being happy with winning a race is not a bad thing. You know, but if that's all you're going to do. You're, you're not going to be fulfilled because there's a deeper purpose for you. And that's to get to level three. And then, as you say, to the level four, to to recognize that uh, that there's something um, uh, infinite that we're, we're called to be. And, and it's a personal thing. So, so can you tie in how like our purpose, you know, what we're made for is reflective in that happiness? And if we don't sort of look at it and understand why are people not happy? We're, we're, we're not going to see why what people's ultimate purpose is. The four levels of purpose come from uh, the four levels of happiness. So just think along these lines, that if you start living a particular level of happiness on what we call a dominant level, so the most significant thing you can, um, you think the most significant kind of happiness, the most significant form of success, why that's level two. The minute you say that, we'll say that's a dominant level two person. 
Now, if that dominant level two person thinks ego comparative advantage is going to bring him true happiness, true success, true self-worth, and he's going to stake everything on it, you can be sure eventually after living in three, four years, it will become definitely purpose in life. Sometimes it only takes a year and it's already ingrained as his purpose in life. And therefore, if you move it even further along, it gets harder and harder to change because it then becomes your identity. It becomes who you are. So think of happiness becomes, one of them will become dominant. When it does, it becomes my purpose in life after I've lived it a little while. And then it becomes my identity, which makes it second nature, right? Very hard to break that, 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 um, that habit. It becomes me, who I am. So it's incumbent on us to move to levels three and four as quickly as possible. Because level two will leave us empty alienated and lonely. It will leave us in the emotions of the comparison game. Who's achieving more? Who's achieving less? Who's got more power, less power, etc. which of course will be nothing more than fear of failure, fear of loss of esteem, inferiority followed by superiority, followed by inferiority again, jealousy, depression, anxiety, self-pity, ego rage, ego blame, and all the other stuff that makes our lives so miserable in our dominant level two culture. So we got to move away from it, remembering if I live level one too long and I start making Linguini and Cadillacs my meaning in life, or if I live level two so long where I become, you know, I can't break away. I got to be more successful, more intelligent, more achieving than anybody else, et cetera. It's going to become my purpose in life. When it does, it's going to be real hard to move me off that until I transform myself into that very being. I make it my second nature. I make it who I am. And the same thing with level three. If I can get off a of level two for just a second, go to a contributive identity, then you can see, right, that the minute that form of happiness, I can make it, um, you know, my dominant form of happiness by prizing it more than anything else, prizing the contributions I make to my family and my friends and my church and community and the kingdom of God and society and culture. If I prize that more than anything and I keep living it, it's going to become my purpose in life. And then I'm going to want to optimize contribution for others in my life. And it's going to become who I am, a naturally good, charitable, loving person. And the same thing, faith brings level three to its fulfillment. Because, of course, God wants all of us to do this with respect to uh, uh, himself. You know, he is the ultimate uh, creation. And so if we are loving one another with that universal mentality, then we know it's not just giving people food that will help. And of course, that's going to be important if they're on the lower levels of the Maslowian scale. However, if you go, um, you know, to the, the true nature of human beings, helping them with their faith, helping them with their children, helping them with, um, you know, their, uh, um, eternal destiny, helping them with their morals, helping them to, to be better people, a more genuine, non-egotistical empathy. Man, if you do that and people move up to there and they start taking that contributive level and now living it to the ultimate transcendent, unrestricted extreme that God intended and provided for us, Oh my gosh, imagine the purpose of your life. It's just going to go right through the ceiling. And not only will it go right through the ceiling in, in terms of what you can do for others, but as you know, Jesus tells us again and again, the man who invested the 10 coins, he's going to get 10 more. And, and, and you know, we're going to be repaid in, in God's own gentleness, goodness, love, unselfish. Uh, non-egotistical uh, love, which is going to bring us ultimately to fulfillment in him, fulfillment in empathy, fulfillment in goodness, fulfillment in truth, of course, our intellectual desires, fulfillment um, in um, uh, above all in love, and, and that fulfillment in love will become truly what Jesus calls joy. Love one another as I have loved you. I tell you all these things that my joy may be yours and your joy may be complete, no greater truth than this.
if you look deeply inside yourself, Carl Rahner had this idea way back when, um, you're going to see that what you will re the only thing that will ultimately underline satisfy you is eternity, infinity, or the unrestricted, we might call it, that mysterious spiritual transcendentness that will uh, you know partially do it perfect truth perfect love perfect beauty perfect being or home perfect goodness that will also do it so all these things are converging together so you know when you say well what is it that will make us ultimately happy since god as it said augustine said made us for himself right what is it that'll make us ultimately happy well it's going to be um, all of those things rolled up into one. What really would make me happy is an infinite or unrestricted eternal being that is perfectly true, good, loving, um, um, uh, uh, beautiful, and, and uh, being or home, and at the same time is the most perfect manifestation of interrelational love that one could ever desire. It's like not just mother and father square, but mother and father to almost the infinite um, exponent. So what you're, uh, what you're dealing with is that's what God made you for. Only he can satisfy you ultimately. Of course, we get sparks and glimmers and even real lasting presences of that sort of being in all the people, the transcendent spiritual people who surround us, right? We were made in the image and likeness of God. And so when you uh, look at that, you can see that, yes, I get around friends and the empathy can be so, you know, I would call it spiritual and almost mystical in a group of unselfish people, not motivated by a lot of ego concerns, you know, and they're all sitting there at the table and it's like family and we don't have to prove to everybody that we're better than everybody. And now, of course, put that to 15 exponents because of the you know, Instagram and social media, et cetera. But the, the main thing is, is if you are on that table and you really have an unselfish group of people that are reflective of the non-egotistical love of God, have you ever noticed that people look at their watch at three o'clock in the morning and go, whoa, it's three o'clock in the morning. Where'd the time go? Well, well, it was lost in the joy of an unselfish love. Yeah. And, and you, we, we really are uh, like God made us in that image. We're hardwired for this. Like the, yeah. our brain, I mean, not just in a spiritual sense, but physically we're hardwired for this. And if you look at psychological psychology studies over and over again, they show people that have a mm -hmm. sense of purpose and meaning in their life have you know, changes in their brain, the less depression, all of these things that, that we are, God, we are hardwired to love and seek the good of others and to seek, you know, the good of the trans and, and, and to, to be in, in union with the, the transcendence. Yeah. We're not going to be satisfied with anything less than what God created us for in his own image and likeness. So we're going to want, you know, the infinite and the unrestricted, the, the eternal, uh, you know, to ground our being, to give us significance and dignity in life, to give us meaning and purpose to, you know, for our lives, to, to give us that, sense of not only our self-worth but ultimately the fulfillment it can only come from transcendence mm -hmm. and the itself and so all those things when you really look at it you know these are built into us as you say and, and you know the person who ignores it winds up in a much worse state uh you know i mean even a person who minimally practices can get some temporary relief from the anxieties uh, mm -hmm. but a person who really does practice begins to take on a sense of peace, a sense of well-being, a sense of self-worth, a sense of groundedness of being that almost avoids malaise altogether, even when life is really, really challenging. Now, of course, when you're suffering a whole lot, you've got to really hold on and you got to make that faith virgin. You know, you really have to call it forth, be with your friends of faith, and you're going to get through it. And when you do, you're going to be transformed by that suffering. Mm -hmm. I remember the same thing when I went blind. Didn't like it. Got, you know, it was a real challenge when things started going wrong. And yet at the same time, um, as I moved through it, 
I began to see a real transformation away from egotism. And of course, a Paul, St. Paul passage, it just, you know, slammed right into my mind was, you know, um, from Second uh, Corinthians 12, you know, you gave me a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting underlined three times proud. It's that darn pride, that ego mm-hmm. that just welling up. Yet, I have learned that in my weakness is my strength. For as I grow weaker, Christ grows stronger in me. Well, Father, I think that's the perfect place to wrap up our conversation right now and ultimately where we'll be wrapping up season one of the Purposeful Lab. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And that was such a contribution to us and to our listeners. Uh, Thanks so very much, Catherine. Dan, uh, it was a real... uh, honor being with you today. Thank you again to Father Spitzer for your generosity of time and for just his intellect, the gift of his intellect that he gave in that interview. Something that really stood out to me was just the importance of really selflessness and how we need to shift beyond me, me, me and give to others, ultimately for our happiness, but not to do it in a utilitarian Mm -hmm. way. Yeah. But it is ultimately what benefits us. Yeah, no, it, it is. Those first two levels of happiness are very inward focused. And uh, the, the, the levels that really motivate us, give us real purpose for the ones that uh, direct us outwards towards others. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, we are a social animal, right? You know, we've mm-hmm. evolved to be in society, to interact with people. And there's something hardwired into us to want to be part of a community and to to, to, to help others in our community. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's something that's a deep need that we, we have sort of written into our, our, our biology. Yeah. So it's not surprising, I think, that um, our, our ultimate happiness is going to come from looking outward, that we're right. not meant to look inward. We're not a isolated creature. We're a biological. We're social, right? Even though our world really just does emphasize our feelings yeah, and, yeah. Our, and our comfort, but that's not going to ultimately satisfy us either, which is why I think, you know, they say if you're really struggling through something, go volunteer because it really, it gets you out of yourself yeah. into, into it, loving it, others and into relationship. Yeah, it, exactly. It, it really, folk, you know, you, 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 you lose yourself and yeah. then you find yourself. It's, it's yes. a very interesting, you, you, you have to lose yourself in others to find exactly. who you are meant to be really. And again, that idea of that comparative happiness, working and living in the dc area i feel like that is the water i swim in here where everyone seems to be and this is a generalization (laughs) but everyone seems to be just trying to climb the success ladder and um again um that's not what we're aimed for and that's not what we're hardwired for No, and, it, and it, it's it's the, there's only one person at the top of the ladder, yeah. so and they're going to get knocked off, and so it, eventually, so no one's ever going to yes. be have lasting happiness because it, it's constantly changing, exactly. and no one's. It's like uh, you know that game you played when you know King of the Mountain. Where I remember we had big snow piles, and we did beat each other up to, to be on the top of the snow pile. Nobody was ever up there permanently. <laughs> Before we head off to the office hours uh, segment, and I mm-hmm. throw some more questions your way. Any just concluding thoughts as we wrap up season one and especially on this topic of human purpose? Yeah, I, I think, you know, just the the idea that, you know, as we've looked at science mm-hmm. and looked at what the world reveals to us, you know, it is uh, a wonder, a sense of wonder of looking at, you know, the, the 14.7 billion year history of our universe. Um, and, and for most people that, that, that stare at the science, uh, the chemistry, the biology, the physics, there's a sense of wonder and mm-hmm. awe that you realize there's something bigger. And as Father Spencer, it should draw you towards that, that, that transcendental, that, that, that the ultimate thing that's infinite. So, you know, our universe, you know, as far as we know, is not is not infinite, right? But it does appear that way from our perspective. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's an infinite number of stars up there when you look up at the night sky. But it it, it, it reflects and pulls you towards that infinite, which is that fourth level of, mm-hmm. of happiness. You know? Father Spitzer, I would say almost summarize that fourth level with that famous quote from St. Augustine of, I am restless until I rest in you. Yeah. And that really kind of captured everything that we're, that we're talking about right. here. Well, with that, 
let's head on over to office hours. Okay. I have some um, questions for you about some news headlines that okay. have been trending. So this first one, there's a team of researchers in the United States and in the United Kingdom, and they say they have created the world's first synthetic human embryo-like structure from stem cells bypassing the need for human eggs and sperm. Now, you are really an expert when it comes to stem cells and, and, and biology. So what does this mean? Are humans no longer needed to create humans? Yeah, this is, this is, we're not nearly at that state yet, but it, it raises a whole set of ethical and moral questions. And as, as often is the case, the science is well out in front of us taking the time to mm -hmm. reflect on what does this mean? But basically what they did is, um, you know, when a, a human um, embryo develops, it, the cells that develop into, you know, the adult body interact with the placenta, you know, mm -hmm. interact with uh, um, the extra embryonic tissues. And so what they did is they took some cells that, um, embryonic stem cells, um, and they took some that they, they, that they differentiated into like uh, the... Uh, embryonic, uh, extra embryonic tissue, like a placental tissue, so that now you have the cells that are going to develop into the organism, plus you have the extra embryonic cells as well. So they're trying to recreate the environment of, you know, normal hmm. development. Um, and uh, they did this uh, back, I think, back uh, a while back with, okay. with mice, and they were able to, to get mice that would generate and look very similar to um, they didn't give it to a live birth, but they got them to, to develop, you know, a head and a, a you know a tail and you know a nervous system on the dorsal side, and so they got it, there was clear differences, and so mm. it didn't look uh, uh, you know exactly the same. But they they are able to do this with the the human ones. I think they've only gone to fourteen days. But the the, the interesting mm. thing is that there's no regulations for this. So there, you know, a lot of people say we shouldn't do um, uh, study human uh, uh, embryos past four, day fourteen. Okay. I, issue studying human embryos mm -hmm. altogether but mm -hmm. now the question is, is this a human embryo right it's 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 yeah. not you know a uh, you know a, it, there's many differences between you know a normal product of fertilization and egg mm -hmm. and sperm and what these things look like so uh, yeah. but there are some similarities and so people want to use this as a model to understand early development but you know that nobody's answered that question is this actually a human embryo yeah, how how similar does it have to be to yeah. be a human and if you if if we don't know the answer to that the question uh, then we should probably not do that because we want to err on the side of caution out of respect to the dignity of, of, right. of human life um, and I think we could do a lot of those experiments in mice right and 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 do there to answer a lot of these these questions but it's a, it's a very um, you know uh, it's a brave new world in uh, yeah. cell biology and what we can do. Um, they actually had to manipulate a few genes to get these things to, to work. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of technological um, things that they had to do to get this thing to sort of develop. Oh, my goodness. And like you said, it almost like raises more questions than answers. Right. So... And the, the fundamental question is, is this a human embryo? People are de uh, debating that, right? Is, is you wow. know, How similar it is. There's people say, no, this is not a... Anything like it, it doesn't develop properly. Others, oh, it is, and and uh, it's it's a big big uh, mess yeah. of, of ethical moral questions. Well, grateful to get your your take on it because I have been seeing that headline trending. So thank you for that. And this is also big news as well. Scientists have now discovered the ingredients for life on Saturn's sixth largest moon. It's been discovered that the moon's ocean contains phosphorus. Uh, so how significant is this development and discovery? And can you explain as a biologist, how does the presence of phosphorus um, indicate that life is possible here on Saturn's moon? Yeah, this is an interesting finding. And when we say life is possible, we're, we're assuming that it's going to be similar to the life that we have on Earth. And if that's the case, phosphorus is, is a key ingredient. So the DNA and the RNA that we find in all of our cells has phosphorus in it. Um, the membranes that surround our cells, all of our cells has, uh, is, is built on uh, phospholipids, so it's phosphate okay. with some fat attached to it. So phosphate is a key ingredient for, um, for, for life. And so finding phosphate, uh, you know, is, 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 is finding if there was no phosphate there, it's probably you're not going to be able to produce life in, in any way that's similar to the life we, we see. Um, and so they were able to capture um, some uh, of the uh, plumes from this the moon and find that there was phosphorus uh, in, uh, in 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 the, the 
the, the plumes that were coming off yeah. of this. I think they got captured, um, not a, a, a physicist or a, a astronomer, right. but I think it, it, they captured it in one of the rings around Saturn that they, they, they could trace right. it to. But the fact that they found it is interesting. And we talked in you know earlier episode about yeah. extraterrestrial life. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting that, that, that these elements that are needed for life are found in a lot of different places. And here's a moon just right here in our solar system that has all those elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and now phosphorus. So you know, it's it's a long leap to get to, <laughs> to to go from those to living organisms, right. but but it's it's interesting. But it's, it's possible. It's, yes, yeah, it's yeah. possible, and yeah. that we'll we'll take it with that. Well, Dr. Keebler, it's been such a joint honor to do season one of the Purposeful Lab with you. I know that I have learned so much, and I'm hope I'm hopeful, and I know that our listeners and viewers have as well. So thanks for guiding us through this this universe together. Yeah, well, thank you for guiding uh, us through this 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 first season. Um, this is uh, it's been great. The guests have, have learned quite a bit yes. from our, our guests, and it's it's always a, a great uh, uh, to listen to them and get their takes on these 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 very these to me very interesting yes, issues. So. Absolutely, no, and I and I want to just let everyone know if you want to learn more about the podcast, if you want to submit a question to Dr. Keebler himself for future office hour segments, you can do that. Head on over to the Magis Center website. All information will be there. And again, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll be alerted when season two drops as well. We'll see you then.